Hello, my name is Jeremy, and this is the True Crime Chronicles channel. On August 2nd, 2015, at 3 a.m., an urgent call was placed to 911 by an older gentleman named Tom Martins. He frantically reported over the phone that his son-in-law, Jason Corbett, had assaulted his daughter, Molly, and that he had intervened by striking Jason on the head with a baseball bat. Tom indicated that Jason was bleeding profusely and might have already passed away. He urgently requested an ambulance to be sent to their location. Jason Corbett, a 39-year-old businessman from Limerick, Ireland, was well known for his cheerful, kind, and energetic personality. He had a twin brother named Wayne and a sister named Tracy. In 2003, at the age of 27, Jason married Margaret Fitzpatrick, and they soon welcomed a son, Jack, and a daughter, Sarah, whom they adored as their prince and princess. The family was a picture of happiness in Ireland, but their joy was tragically short-lived. In 2006, shortly after Sarah's birth, Margaret, who had a long history of asthma, experienced a severe attack. She woke Jason in the middle of the night, struggling to breathe. Jason tried to help by giving her medication and an inhaler, but her condition worsened. In a panic, he called for an ambulance, but Margaret tragically passed away during the journey to the hospital. When Jason Corbett, a 30-year-old director of a small packaging company in Ireland, lost his wife, he was left to raise his two-year-old son and three-month-old daughter on his own. His friends observed his profound sadness and struggled to cope with the loss. A year after his wife's passing, Jason sought a nanny and housekeeper to help with his children. This search led him to Molly Martins, a 25-year-old American woman. Molly arrived in Ireland from the United States in March 2008 and a longtime friend of Jason's met her at the airport. This friend instantly had reservations about Molly, feeling she wasn't fit for the role of a nanny and housekeeper. She appeared young for her age, sporting a flamboyant style with a bright coat adorned with a fur collar, cowboy boots, lush curls, and heavy makeup. To the friend, Molly resembled more of a theatrical queen than a serious candidate for the position. Molly Martins grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, she dropped out of Clemson University and planned to start a new chapter in her life in Ireland. She instantly bonded with Jason's son and daughter, being tender and caring. Soon, Jason's close friends noticed how he gradually recovered after the death of his first wife. He seemed to thaw and came back to life. Feelings sparked between Jason and Molly, and they began a romantic relationship. The couple, along with Jack and Sarah, went on a vacation. They had a great time and grew closer, beginning to plan their future life together. Two years later, on Valentine's Day 2010, Jason invited Molly to a cafe. There, he gave her a ring and proposed. Overjoyed, Molly immediately started planning their wedding in America. She convinced Jason to move to her home country, and he agreed. In 2011, he sold his house and transferred his job to the States. The family settled in Davidson County, North Carolina, where Jason and Molly got married in a ceremony attended by many relatives and friends from both America and Ireland. Molly, after marrying Jason, worked as a swimming instructor, but primarily focused her attention on Jack and Sarah, Jason's children. Jason, meanwhile, held a managerial position in the United States. While their life initially appeared joyful, over time, their marital relationship started to deteriorate. This tension culminated on August 1, 2015, when Molly's parents, Tom and Sharon Martins, visited the Corbett family's home around 11 p.m. Jason welcomed them in the driveway and assisted with their luggage. Tom brought a baseball bat as a gift for Jack, Jason's son, who was out at a party with friends at the time and did not receive the gift immediately. That evening, Jason, Molly, her parents, and Sarah had dinner together, opting for pizza. Jack returned home around 11 p.m., but Tom chose not to give him the baseball bat at such a late hour, intending to present it the following morning. After 11 p.m., the family retired for the night. Molly and Jason slept in the master bedroom on the first floor with the children, Jack and Sarah, in adjacent rooms. Molly's parents were accommodated in the guest room on the second floor. In the early hours of August 2nd, around 3 a.m., Tom Martins called 911 claiming his son-in-law Jason had attacked Molly and he had struck Jason with a baseball bat in response. Tom requested urgent assistance, unsure of Jason's condition, who lay unconscious and bleeding. The
the 911 dispatcher guided Tom and Molly through cardiopulmonary resuscitation procedures in an effort to revive Jason before medical help arrived. When police and ambulance services arrived 10 minutes later, they found Molly outside near a car, appearing distraught and in shock, but without actual tears. Inside, they discovered 39-year-old Jason Corbett's lifeless body in the main bedroom, surrounded by blood splatters across the bed, walls, and floor. Both Tom's and Molly's clothing bore bloodstains, and dried blood marked Jason's body. Near Jason lay a baseball bat and a large cobblestone, both with traces of blood, as well as an overturned lamp. Throughout this ordeal, Jack and Sarah remained asleep in their rooms. Tom and Molly did not deny their involvement in Jason's death, asserting self-defense. They were subsequently taken to the station for questioning. At the police station, 66-year-old Tom Martins, an FBI veteran with 30 years of experience, stated that his son-in-law was insane and constantly tormented his daughter. According to Tom, Jason was drunk that evening. Everyone went to bed, but Tom woke up at night because he heard screams and loud voices on the first floor of the house. He jumped out of bed, grabbed a baseball bat, and ran downstairs. Tom entered the main bedroom and saw Jason holding Molly by the throat with both hands. Tom yelled, let her go, to which Jason turned to the elderly man and said, I will kill her. Tom Martins claimed his protective instincts kicked in instantly. He hit Jason with the baseball bat, but the forces were unequal. Jason seemed not to feel the blow. He tried to drag Molly into the bathroom and close the door, but Tom interfered. Jason pushed the old man, who fell and his glasses flew off. Tom confessed that at that moment, he thought he was going to be killed. Jason saw the bat on the floor and reached for it, at which point Molly grabbed a stone and saying, Don't touch my dad, hit her husband on the head with all her might. After that, Tom grabbed the baseball bat and began hitting Jason until he fell to the floor. 32-year-old Molly Corbett, during interrogation, told investigators the same story. She said that at night, her daughter Sarah woke up and started screaming from night terrors, waking Jason, who became very angry and lashed out at his wife. He began to strangle her and said he would kill her. Her father came to Molly's aid. Molly confessed that she hit her husband on the head with a heavy stone to save her dear dad. When the police asked where she got the heavy, large stone, Molly answered that it was on her bedside table. They had planned to paint the cobblestone with the children, wanting to make beautiful flower beds and decorate them with colorful stones. The woman couldn't remember how many times she hit her husband, only saying it was a real battle for her life. Midway through the interrogation, Molly told the investigators that she was still in pain from her husband's choking hold. They photographed her, including a red mark in the center of her neck. Later, police compared these photos with the ones taken at the time of the arrest, and it turned out that there were no red spots on the woman's neck at the time of detention. Molly confessed that the fight between her and her husband had occurred the day before the tragedy. At that time, Jason grabbed her by the arms and neck. Throughout the interrogation, she constantly complained of throat pain. Both Tom and Molly asserted in unison that Jason Corbett was brutally treating his wife, but his family said the opposite. Tracy Lynch, sister of the deceased Jason Corbett, shared insights about the peculiar relationship dynamics observed during Jason's wedding to Molly. Tracy noticed that Molly exerted considerable control over Jason, often becoming upset if things didn't align with her expectations. Her reluctance to interact with Jason's visiting relatives raised further concerns. Further alarm was added by the revelation of one of Molly's friends, who stated that Molly had told everyone that she had been friends with Jason's first wife, Margaret, until Margaret died of cancer, contradicting family reports because everyone knew she had died of an asthma attack. Despite these red flags and attempts by Jason's family and friends to dissuade him from the marriage due to Molly's odd behavior, the wedding proceeded. This event marked the beginning of a complicated and troubled union. Initially, Molly and Jason Corbett's marriage appeared harmonious, with Molly forming a close bond with Jason's children, Jack and Sarah, and treating them as her own. However, as their first wedding anniversary approached in 2012, Jason expressed a desire to return to Ireland, his homeland, citing unhappiness in a foreign country. This disclosure marked the beginning of a decline in the couple's relationship, Despite Jack and Sarah referring to Molly as their mother, Jason resisted Molly's intentions to legally adopt them, wanting to preserve the memory of their biological mother. During this period, Molly's behavior started to change noticeably. Jason grew increasingly concerned about her mental well-being, suspecting she might have a psychological disorder. 
he observed a stark contrast between her initially sweet demeanor and her subsequent behavior, which he perceived as more manipulative and controlling. Molly began to isolate Jason from his family, often curtailing his phone conversations with them to mere seconds. Following the untimely death of his first wife, Jason Corbett designated his sister, Tracy Lynch, as the legal guardian for his children, Jack and Sarah, in the event of his own demise. Tracy was well aware that if something happened to Jason, Molly would strongly contest the custody of the children. When Jason passed away, Tracy promptly traveled to North Carolina to file for custody, anticipating a legal battle with Molly, who also sought custody rights. During the course of their strained marriage, Molly had sought legal counsel to understand her rights over Jason's children in the event of a divorce. Her lawyer advised her to document their disputes and accumulate incriminating evidence against Jason. Consequently, Molly began secretly recording their conversations. In these recordings, Molly appeared disengaged, often ignoring Jason's repeated questions while he escalated his voice. A close friend of Molly's disclosed that although Molly rarely discussed her marital issues, she began to express negative sentiments about Jason following his death. Molly confided to her friend that Jason was domineering and abusive, accusing him of forcing her into intimate acts, verbally abusing her, and progressively worsening in his treatment towards her. Despite these allegations, Molly did not report these incidents to the authorities. Four days after Jason Corbett's tragic demise, his children, Jack and Sarah, aged 10 and 8, were interviewed by a child welfare professional. In this interview, they shared observations about the relationship between their parents. Notably, they mentioned their mother, Molly, being cautious about not waking their father, Jason, fearing it might anger him. Jack specifically talked about a cobblestone that was kept on the bedside table. He clarified that they had brought the stone inside due to rain, intending to decorate it later. Regarding their parents' interactions, both Jack and Sarah described incidents where they witnessed physical altercations initiated by their father against Molly. They recounted occasions where Jason physically assaulted Molly, including hitting and pushing her and frequently snapping at her over minor issues. Subsequent to these revelations, Jack and Sarah were temporarily placed under the care of their biological aunt, Tracy Lynch. Tracy, who had traveled from Ireland, stayed in a North Carolina hotel during the unfolding custody battle. By the time Jason Corbett's autopsy was completed, it revealed the grim details of his demise. The cause of death was a traumatic brain injury. Jason had suffered approximately 12 strikes to the head with both a baseball bat and a brick. These blows were concentrated on the same area, leading to his scalp being severely torn from his skull and his skull itself being fractured. Notably, the medical examiner concluded that at least one of these strikes was inflicted after Jason had already passed away. The toxicology report provided additional insights. It indicated that Jason's blood contained slightly higher than normal levels of alcohol. Additionally, traces of trazodone, an antidepressant medication commonly prescribed for insomnia, were also found in his system. Jason Corbett was laid to rest in his hometown, Limerick, Ireland, alongside his first wife, Margaret. Their shared tombstone is adorned with a wedding photograph, serving as a poignant reminder of their lives and the bond they shared. Sixteen days after Jason Corbett's passing, his sister Tracy Lynch took his children, Jack and Sarah, to Ireland, separating them from their stepmother, Molly. Molly was left in a state of shock and despair upon discovering that Jack and Sarah had been taken to another country. She attempted to reach out to them through phone calls and social media posts, hoping these messages would somehow reach the children. Meanwhile, Molly and Tom consistently maintained that their actions against Jason were in self-defense, but the investigation into Jason's death was ongoing. Tracy Lynch, however, was convinced of a different motive. She believed that Molly was aware of Jason's plans to leave her and take their children with him. Tracy speculated that on the night of the incident, Jason had informed Molly of his decision, and Molly, fearing loneliness, reacted violently. In Ireland, Jack and Sarah received psychological support and gradually adapted to their new environment. Nine months after their father's tragic demise, they confessed that they had been coerced into lying about the alleged domestic violence at home. They disclosed that Molly had manipulated them into fabricating stories about their father's behavior, threatening them with the loss of contact with her if they refused to comply. Contrary to their earlier statements, the children clarified that their father had never been abusive towards Molly. 
In the course of the inquiry, investigators uncovered Molly Corbett's past connection with her ex-partner, Keith Majin. He revealed numerous captivating insights about her earlier life. Keith and Molly connected through a dating website, instantly falling for each other at their initial encounter. They moved in together after a mere six weeks. Keith acknowledged Molly's spirit of independence, joviality, lightheartedness, and uniqueness. Nonetheless, she eventually disclosed to him her struggle with bipolar disorder. Keith didn't overly worry about this revelation, as Molly was on medication and generally well, except for occasional shifts in behavior when she missed her doses. She wasn't violent or prone to outbursts, but would, for instance, insist on not letting Keith leave during disputes. Molly would often spend extended periods in the bathtub, then sit on the cold floor, weeping. Despite these challenges, they continued their life together without plans for children. Molly informed Keith she was on contraceptives, but unexpectedly declared they were expecting a child. At this juncture, Keith, the family's sole earner, faced financial strain and felt unprepared for parenthood. His discovery of an unopened pack of contraceptives in Molly's wardrobe led him to realize her deceit. Yet Keith, as an honorable man, proposed to Molly, who accepted joyfully, undeterred by her health issues. She maintained her regimen of antidepressants and other medications, sometimes taking up to 16 pills daily, which caused Keith concern for their unborn child's well-being. Molly once dreamt of losing the baby, and tragically, the next day, the hospital confirmed the fetus's demise. This incident further strained their relationship. Molly plunged into profound mourning and was diagnosed with severe depression, documented in her medical records. Her parents began supporting her more fervently, simultaneously developing a disdainful view of Keith, casting him as the antagonist. In early 2008, Molly informed her fiancé of her plan to go to Europe to find work as a nanny or a house assistant. In March, she packed her belongings and left the apartment she had been renting with her fiancé. Ten days later, Molly called Keith to tell him that she was in Ireland, had found a job, and that everything was fine. From that point on, they never spoke or saw each other again. Keith Majin first heard from a North Carolina detective in October 2015 through an email, where he discovered the unfortunate events that had unfolded. It was revealed that Molly had kept her significant relationship, engagement, and subsequent departure to another country from her fiancé a secret from everyone. Keith admitted that upon viewing an interview featuring Tom and Molly, where they portrayed the late Justin Corbett as malevolent and dreadful, he found their story unconvincing and perceived their expressions as merely facades. In January 2016, half a year following Jason's demise, Tom and Molly were unexpectedly indicted for second-degree murder. By July 2017, two years since the incident, the father and daughter duo faced their trial together. They maintained their stance of having acted in self-defense in Jason's killing. During the trial, Tom Martins claimed his actions were what any true father would do, protect his daughter. He believed it was a life or death situation and did all he could to safeguard both Molly and himself. Tom confessed to being the one who struck Jason with a bat, ceasing only when he was sure Jason no longer posed a threat. The prosecution contended in court that the severity of the blows indicated deep-seated animosity, not mere self-defense. An expert, analyzing the bloodstains, deduced that some strikes were dealt when Jason's head was 30 to 50 symmetry off the ground, suggesting Tom continued to hit him even when he was down and no longer dangerous. Bloodstains on Molly's pajama bottoms suggested her proximity to Jason during these blows. A long, light-colored hair, possibly Molly's, was discovered in Jason's hand but wasn't tested. The autopsy revealed defensive injuries on Jason's left hand, but known on his right, which he might have used to grab Molly by the throat. During the trial, Lt. Frank Young, assigned to document injuries on Tom and Molly on the night of the incident, took the stand. He recounted observing Molly self-inflicting marks on her neck. Lt. Young repeatedly instructed her to stop and noted that apart from dried blood on her cheek, forehead, and hair, he saw no other injuries on her. Similarly, Tom exhibited no injuries on the front of his shirt. However, blood was detected on his watch dial, beneath his fingernails and his glasses remained unbroken. Paramedic Amanda Hackworth also testified, stating that upon her arrival at the scene and upon examining Jason's body, she found his torso already cold, with patches of dried blood. 
This contradicted Molly's assertion that they had immediately called 911 after Jason lost consciousness and collapsed. The trial further revealed that Jason Corbett had a life insurance policy naming Molly as the beneficiary. Additionally, it was disclosed that Jason had frequently sent money to Molly's parents during his lifetime. For example, in 2011, he sent $50,000 to Tom, purportedly for wedding expenses. A neighbor of the Corbett's came forward during the trial, recounting how he and Jason had spent the evening together, drinking beer from about 3.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. The neighbor described Jason as very relaxed. He witnessed Tom and his wife arriving at the Corbett's residence, with Jason welcoming them and assisting in carrying heavy bags from their car into the house. His interactions with his in-laws were also noted as calm. The court heard from a nurse whom the couple had seen before the tragic event. She reported that she had prescribed trazodone to Molly just a few days prior to the incident on July 30th, 2015. Jason had visited the hospital two weeks before his demise, where he expressed concerns about frequent bouts of dizziness, tension, and unprovoked anger. Following nine days filled with witness accounts, debates, and disturbing crime scene photos, the jury reached a verdict in just three hours. Molly Corbett and her father, Tom Martins, were convicted of second-degree murder and received sentences of 20 and 25 years in prison, respectively. When the verdict was read, Molly turned to her mother and expressed regret, stating, I'm so sorry, but I shouldn't have let him kill me. Although the convicted appeared to have faced justice, the case was still not entirely closed. Merely an hour after the jury delivered their verdict, a juror accidentally disclosed outside the courthouse that they had discussed Jason Corbett's case prior to the formal deliberation period, a significant breach of legal protocol. Following this revelation, the defense quickly submitted a request to overturn the conviction, citing the juror's misconduct. However, the trial court judge dismissed this motion. A year on, the defense approached the appellate court, highlighting various investigative errors. Among these was the issue of blood stains on Tom Martins's shorts. The prosecution had suggested these stains, which were assumed to be Jason's blood but never actually tested, indicated Tom standing over Jason during the assault. The prosecutor deemed testing every blood spot impractical and unnecessary. The defense also emphasized the importance of the initial statements made by Jack and Sarah. They initially claimed their father was abusive towards Molly and expressed fear of him. The defense argued that the siblings' later retractions, where they admitted to lying, were influenced by professionals pressuring them to change their testimony. On February 4, 2020, the North Carolina Court of Appeals determined that Tom Martins and Molly Corbett should be granted a new trial. This decision was later upheld by the Supreme Court of North Carolina. Subsequently, both were released on a $200,000 bond while awaiting the retrial. They were required to hand over their passports and were forbidden from making any contact with Jack and Sarah. Currently, Jason Corbett's case has been moved to Forsyth County, North Carolina for additional legal proceedings, marking a minor triumph for Tom and Molly. Jason's children, Jack and Sarah, are now residing with their biological aunt in Ireland. Sarah, aged 16, has authored a series of books aimed at helping others deal with the loss of parents. Tracy Lynch, Jason's sister, has also penned a book about her brother during these years of legal battles. She aims to share the kindness and decency of Jason Corbett with the world. A notable excerpt from Tracy's book reads, Deep down, I smile when I realize that Jason has finally returned to the only place on this earth he ever wanted to be, in the arms of his beloved Margaret. If you found this story interesting, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Also, don't forget to share your opinion in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you in the next video.